Okay, guys, hopefully some of you brought your uh, textbooks, the James Smith book, Pentateuch. I want us to go back, and I want us to look, spend just a few moments on the offerings, because I think it, that's going to set up a, uh, a good foundation for everybody. And what I'd like to do is I want to have somebody, I'll read, I'll start out. I'm on page 358. And if nobody in class has their books, then we're going to have a little lesson on bringing your textbook to class. Uh, hopefully you guys have got that. I'm going to start reading. We're talking about the different types of offerings, and I want us to go all the way through to, uh, to page 363, and I'm going to have you guys read some as well. Listen very carefully to what he says. The first three of the five basic offerings of Israel, the burnt, the meal, and the peace offerings, are distinguished from the other two in five ways. Number one, they were a pleasing odor to Yahweh. Number two, no particular violation or occasion prompted these sacrifices. So they were done basically out of free will just because. Number three, they're characterized by the expression, it shall be accepted for him. Number four, they were voluntary. Number five, the blood associated with these offerings was thrown against the outer altar. These consecration offerings were designed to help a believer maintain his fellowship with God. Somebody there who has got your textbook, read for all of us what it says under burnt offering starting on 358. The burnt offering is the first discussed because it set forth most clearly the fundamental foundational principles of the sacrificial ritual. For this reason, Israel is commanded to present a lamb as a burnt offering every morning and evening as, at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The Hebrew term which designated this offering, which I can't read, signifies that which raises or ascends. The animal is completely consumed in the fire and ascended in the smoke to the Lord. The burnt offering could be taken from the herd, 1-3, from the flock, either sheep or goats, 1-10, or from fowl, either dove or pigeon, 1-14. The general principle which applied to the larger animals was male without blemish. The same language is used in Hebrew 9.14 and 1 Peter 1.19 in reference to the offering by Christ. The ritual of the burnt offering consisted of six steps, three by the worshiper and three by the offici officiating priest. The worshiper was to do the following. One, he was to present his offering at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Two, he then placed his hands upon the head of the animal and leaned upon it. This action was called Semica, and symbolize the sinner's identification with the animal and his dependence upon the sacrificial ritual. The animal was being substituted for the sinner. The offering could then make atonement for him, one for, according to some, the word atonement, kipper, points to the uh, converging of sin. Others say the basic idea is that it, that of a cleansing. Three, he then slew the animal as the priest caught the blood in a pan. Thus the worshiper had vividly impressed upon his mind that the wages of sin is death. One, three, through five. The three acts performed by the priest were to, one, sprinkle the blood of the animal on the four sides of the bronze altar, two, skin the animal, cut into pieces, and burn its head in fat, and three, wash the burnt, wash the burn and remaining wash and burn the remaining pieces of the animal, 1, 5b through 9. This ritual was the same for sheep and goats of the, as the bullocks, 1, 9 through 13, which with birds and, sorry, with birds the procedure differed slightly. The priest wrung off the head of the bird at the altar and burned it. The blood was poured out of the at the altar. The crop was removed and thrown into the ashes, the carcass of the bird was then torn up by the wings and burned on the altar, 1, 14 through 17. The distinguishing feature of the burnt offering was that the entire animal was burned on the altar. The offering of these animals in faith and the obedience of the prescribed ritual rendered the burnt offering an aroma pleasing to God, 1, 9. Okay, thank you for doing that. Remember where we are in the big, big picture things. We started a priestly nation. God is telling them exactly what he expects, and a part of that expectation is from here on out, you're going to start offering 
offerings. Some of these are going to be have-tos, meaning if you sin, here's what you got to do. Some of these are going to be simply just to keep you in good graces, so to speak, with the Lord. So right now what we're talking about are the three basic offerings that they would do all the time. Every single morning they would get up and, and they would offer this burnt offering. Notice at the uh, the top of 359, it talks about there being six steps, three done by the worshiper, three done by the uh, officiating priest. Who would the worshiper be? Person making the offering? That'd be you guys, or the, the member, so to speak. So can you imagine the, uh, you know, the folks at Bear Valley? Their job was to present an offering at the tent, place his hands on it, lean upon it, and then number three, he cut its neck or slew the animal as the priest caught the blood in a pan. How many folks at Bear Valley do you think would like to go back to this way of worship? Of course, you got some weirdos that might, but... <laughs> I'm laying low today, Brad. I was going to say, everybody's pointing at law, man. That's wrong. <laughs> but, but what I want you to see is, guys, this was something they did every single morning. And there was a, a part that the priest had to play. There was a part that the person had to play, the lay person had to play. And this was just one of three. Somebody else who's got your book? Pick up, start reading uh, with a meal offering. Meal offerings were presented independently or in conjunction with the bloody offering. The main ingredient was fine flour or raw meal, as some prefer. Oil, frankincense, and salt, 2, 1, and 13, were to be added to the meal. Oil, perhaps, symbolizes the Holy Spirit and salt. The concept of uh, preservation, preservation, leaven and honey to eleven were strictly forbidden. Both of these substances, while perfectly acceptable in ordinary food, were considered corrupting elements in sacrifices. Cooked meal offerings, cakes, or wafer could be prepared. Using oven, griddle, or pan, chapter 2, 4 through 10. Another type of meal offering consisted of crushed heads of new grain roasted in fire, chapter 2, 14 through 16. The ritual of meal, meal offering was very simple. The offering in whatever form it was given to the priest, they burned a memorial portion on the altar. This, like a burnt, like the burnt offering, is described as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The rest of the meal offering was deemed holy and was reserved for Aaron and his sons. Okay, very good. Somebody, real quick, go ahead and knock out peace offering. The peace or fellowship offering is actually a class of three offerings according to Leviticus 7, 12 through 18. These offerings could come from the herd, the flock, or from goats. The animal could be male or female, but it had to be without blemish. The ritual of the peace offering was similar to that of the burnt offering through the first five steps outlined above. The distinguishing feature of this offering was that part of the animal, the breast and thigh, was given to the priest. The rest of the animal was eaten by the worshiper and his family. Essentially what happened was this. After the memorial portion of the animal was offered up to God, the rest was cooked for a religious meal. The regulations stipulated that the worshippers must never eat any fat or blood. The fat offering connected with kidneys, no, the fat covering connected with kidneys and liver belonged to God. The prohibition against eating fat applied only to the fat of sacrificial animals and in these only to those portions that were expressly mentioned. Okay, I want everybody in there to kind of take note of the charts that are given on 360, 361, because I think these are great summaries, and it really is going to help you guys get a, a handle on what God was expecting and why. You notice down the left-hand left side, it talks about uh, the material that was to be offered, what was God's part, what was the priest's portion, uh, how was blood to be handled, 
was the symbolism and ultimately the purpose. And we know the purpose of these first three was to maintain fellowship with God. We then go into a different, whole different type of sacrifices. So these were all the three that we just talked about. This was basically just a, a daily ritual to keep in good graces with God. Yeah. Uh, but you said everybody did this every day? Is that, are you saying every, every individual? Or no, 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 no. No, no, no. This, you had to have a burnt offering every day. Uh, if you notice, it said every morning and evening there had to be a burnt offering. said, uh, for this reason, Israel was commanded to present a lamb as a burnt offering every morning and evening at the entrance of the tent meeting. Israel being the group in general. Can you imagine, Jared, just for a second, what would happen if all two million people had to do this? Well, that's what I was asking, Brad. Just... <laughs> There'd be a lot of animals and a lot of blood. Yeah. I mean, you, well, you would well, be nothing, I mean, doing was, nothing but... You would be processing meat all the time, just one after the other. Because think about how many minutes there are in a day, how many animals you would have to go through yeah. in every single minute. I didn't think it was possible. No. Okay, so we, we've got these three that are voluntary. These This is basically something that they get to do. And then we turn the lens on on two types that they must do. And by that I mean any time there is, is a sin, they've got to then turn to cleansing offerings. That is to make sure that they can stay within those boxes, so to So let's see. Somebody, and I don't offend it, somebody talking about the offerings. <laughs> somebody, uh, somebody read for it. Let me, let me start out. Two offerings were required when sin entered the life of an Israelite, the sin offering and the trespass offering. These offerings were introduced by Moses, and thus a more detailed description of the meaning and purpose of them is given. Nine times the text states that one who offered these offerings shall be forgiven. The sin and the trespass offerings were designed to restore believers' fellowship with God once that fellowship had been broken. Somebody read for me the, uh, the information on sin offering. <clears throat> Emphasis is continue, continually placed on the fact that sin offerings were valid only if the transgression was unintentional. The guilty party was unaware of the matter and was only made aware of the sin later. Uh, that his action constituted a sin had not occurred to him. The assurance is given throughout the presentation of the sin offering uh, that the presentation of the sin offering would be followed by atonement and forgiveness for 20, 26 or the sin offering was graded according to the status of the person who committed the sin. In the case of a priest, 4.1, or the entire congregation, 4.13, a young fool was required. In the case of a ruler, a male goat. A private citizen was required to bring a female goat or a lamb. And in the case of a poor brother, a dove or a pigeon might be offered, or even the tenth of an uh, of fine flour. And in the case of the flour, no oil or incense was to be put into it. Uh, sorry, put on it, since it was a sin offering. Otherwise, the offering of flour was to be treated like a meal offering. The ritual of sin, of the sin offering, as far as the worshipper was concerned, was the same as were burnt and peace offering. Uh, presentation, identification, and slaughter of the animal. The priestly ritual, however, was more extensive and involved six steps. Number one, the priest was to sprinkle the blood seven times in front of the curtain of the sanctuary. Number two, he was then to smear blood on the horns of the altar of incense inside the holy place. This constituted a plea for atonement, since from this altar ascended a cloud of incense, which was a symbol of supplication. Uh, number three, next, blood was to be smeared on the horns of uh, the bronze altar. Before the following portion of the blood was poured out at the base of bronze altar. Number five, the fat of the animal was then burned on the altar. Number six, the rest of the animal was taken outside the camp and burned on an ash pile. Leviticus 5 discusses some special applications of the sin offering. 
three specific sins which might require a sin offering were first named. Uh, these are one, withholding testimony, two, accidental ceremonial defilement, and three, idol swearing. In these cases, a female sheep or a goat was required as an offering. If he was unable to afford this, uh, the sinner was to bring two doves or pigeons, the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. All right, very good. One last one I have you guys take a look at. What about a trespass offering? The trespass offering had the following in common with the sin offering. One, both were required following an unintentional transgression. Two, both procured atonement. The trespasses, the trespass offering differed from the sin offering in that, one, it applied only to an individual. Two, the animal was slaughtered and eaten by the priest. Three, it could consist only of a ram. Four, it pertained to misappropriation of what belonged either to the Lord, chapter 5, verse 15 through 19, or to a fellow Israelite, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And five, it required a restitution penalty of 20%. Hmm. The trespass offering was presented after an act of unfaithfulness a term which refers to a violation of God's holiness. In the case of theft from a fellow Israelite, the sacrilege was committed when a false oath was taken which called upon God to confirm that which was not true. All right. So hopefully what that does is, is it clears up a little bit for you guys some of the uh, details that he was given in the book of Leviticus regarding offerings. You've got three that that we would refer to kind of as a voluntary means to keep them in good graces. You got two that they had to do whenever they sinned. Now, those five offerings, we set those aside for just a moment, and every single year, what did they also have to do? Somebody said it. Keely, is that you? No, we said the atonement. Yeah, atonement. So not only do we have the, the sin, the trespass offerings, every single year to keep these people clean, to keep them different from the world, they also had to go through the atonement process. So somebody tell me in your own words, why was God specifying all of this detail? What was he ultimately looking for? There's, there's a couple of things that we've talked about hinted about that the reason why God is going to such great distinction here. They want to make sure that the people remain pure. Okay. Because why? What What's the big deal there? Uh, it was said holiness, that they can keep their relationship with God. He is holy. Okay. When you think the book of Leviticus, you better be thinking holy. God is holy. Okay. So that's number one. What else? What's another, what's another strong point we need to take from all of this? Well, one point we take from this that we apply to our worship today is God is very specific. He wants to be obeyed. He has a way he wants it done. He doesn't want us to just do whatever to worship him. Absolutely. He wants right. obedience, folks. He wants us to do it the way that he has set forth. And, you know, it, it frustrates me a lot of times when people assume that, hey, well, I can worship him any way I want to, I can do anything I want to, and yet the fact of the matter is God was very specific to them to make sure that they were going to be obedient. You know, he could have told them eight rams or 20 rams or whatever he wanted. Did God actually need the ram or the goat or the, the sheep or the dove? No. No, he didn't need it. He doesn't need anything. But he wanted these people to be a special cleansed people who were trying to be righteous for him. And having given them free will, he wanted to make sure that they were going to do it his way. Uh, those of you who were keeping up last time, we left off in about Leviticus chapter 20. So if you got your Bibles, let's flip open there. What I want to do is I want to cover...
Uh, let's get on down through uh, chapter 22, and then I'm going to I want to read to you some stuff from uh, from another book, a book that I've mentioned that hopefully is going to bring some of this all together for you. Chapter 21. Well, let's let's finish up with chapter 20. Talks about penalties for breaking the law. You remember we talked about God gave the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are pretty good, but he wanted to put some flesh on the skeleton. And by that I mean, okay, not only are you to honor your father and mother, not only are you to not to, to murder, but here are all of the laws regarding murder. Here are all of the laws regarding your parents. Here are all of the laws regarding coveting. Now, after he has set forth the law, he's got to give them what? You gotta give them the punishment. Guys, it does no good to have a law if there is no punishment. Okay? If your kids hear you say, don't do that or, I, or you're gonna get in trouble. How many of you guys have seen, seen little children in a, in a shopping situation where their parents try to correct them and their mom says, you know, stop doing that or else you're gonna get in trouble. And the kid keeps doing it because the kid knows they're not gonna get in trouble. Have you seen that? Yes, too many times. Okay. So somebody then tell me why in the Church of Christ do we not use discipline anymore? We do? <laughs> we, do? I, we just withdrew from a brother last year. Last year? <laughs> well, everybody else has behaved since then. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good. It works. <laughs> That's good. In, in all seriousness, guys, how many congregations out there do you think actively practice church discipline? Not many. You know, when I get out and go and teach and preach, I don't see this going on very much. And it's to me, it's just like that, that parent-child situation. You know, if the preacher gets up and says, hey, you need to be doing this, but the parent never backs it up, i.e., the elders don't ever back it up, then, then, you know, realistically, what have you got? You got a child who knows I'm never going to get in trouble. So I can keep behaving the way I want to. That's kind of what, what we see going on here. He is first, he's laying forth, this is, this is the law. Now these are the penalties for breaking that law. Chris. Uh, I'm kind of curious as to, I guess that might be a little subjective in, in some ways uh, as far as what the punishment would be by an eldership. I, I know at Greenbrier, it was pretty common for them to call members in to, to speak with them. Uh, but we, I, in the five years that I was there, it was never, we never, never withdrew from anybody. Okay. In the five years that you were there, did you know for sure of folks who were living in sin? Yeah. Okay. Now, that's what I'm saying is there's an attempt. I, I don't know the reasoning behind. I, I can't speak to the elders, and I'm not one of one myself, so I don't know the reasoning behind they did not do certain things. Right. Maybe that they were given them more time for some reason. Maybe they knew the circumstances better than I did. I don't know. Right, and I'm not. I'm definitely not trying to, um, you know, presuppose that I know I'm, I'm smarter than your elders or that I know that situation. But I do know the Bible gives very specific instructions on how we are to handle erring members. That is, members that know the truth and that are committing sin. And very rarely do we have leadership that, that will follow that particular guideline. And folks, it's just as biblical as giving or taking of the Lord's Supper it's it's in the same exact inspired scripture as all of the other things that we follow. So, you know, one of the things that you as preachers, young men, are going to face is when you get assigned to a, a place, let me strongly encourage you to find out, number one, where the elders are on that. But number two, if let's say it's a good work and you fit well, but they don't practice church discipline, let me strongly encourage you to either sit down and, and teach them on it or teach the congregation on it so that maybe through time things can kind of be brought back to where they should be. What is the number one reason given of why we don't do this? Don't want to run away members. Okay, yeah, maybe JT. I, I think uh, many uh, leaders have family members 
that need discipline, <laughs> and they yeah. quit because of that. That's that's a that's huge. I mean, you think about it in the church. How many church families do we have where either elders' immediate family or extended family are living in either bad marriages or maybe they're living with somebody outside of marriage or maybe they don't come as often as they should. You know, maybe it's kind of a Christmas, Easter, once a month only kind of deal. And even though they should be corrected, they're kind of let let slide. I'd, I'd say one of the things, though, that is uh, is really on the minds of many of the elders are lawsuits. Mm-hmm. Does everybody there, are you very aware of what happened about 22 years ago in, in Texas? I uh, made it to the Phil Don, Donahue show yeah. where a lady, she was disfellowshipped. They brought her on a, a TV talk show. And they actually brought several, what I would call, big guns from the church. And people like Garland Robinson, um, I think Curtis Cates was in there, several several guys who know the Bible. And Phil Donahue sitting there questioning, why in the world would you ever kick this person out? All she did, you know, was basically she slept around and they caught her. They physically caught her. Uh, sleeping around with folks, and so the church did what the church is supposed to do. Well, lo and behold, it made national news, and the lady sued and won. It was like a defamation of character lawsuit. And so now you got a lot of congregations who are very hesitant to do what this book says because they don't want to be hit with a lawsuit. When we withdrew from the individual last year, he was trying to take us to court as well, uh, but he has since then died. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to hear about the death, oh, no. but that's... that's, that's <laughs> you got three years? That's pretty good. There, there are occasions where I wish this wasn't being taped and this would be one of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> let, let me clarify. I, I I am sorry that the person died, but hey, at least that, that, that beat out the court system. Um, you know, in all seriousness, guys, if we've got brothers who are taking brothers to court over things like this, it tells me we've got bigger problems because what does the Bible say about lawsuits? We should be able to judge ourselves. You don't, you don't ever need to take the church's dirty laundry into the public square. Ever, ever. Okay? So, all right. So then, so chapter 20 is basically giving us the penalties for all this stuff. If you do this, here's the penalty. Here's what it's going to be. Uh, we talked about, like, verse 13, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them are committed an abomination, they shall be put to death. Not a whole lot of question about where God stands on homosexuality. Notice verse 27, a man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. How many of you guys in the room know your horoscope sign? What's your astrological sign? How many of you know that? Oh, uh, look at y'all scaredy cats. Don't even want to raise your hand. <laughs> I think I heard it once. I can't remember. How many people do you think daily read their horoscope? A lot. A <laughs> lot. Has it ever occurred to you guys that more people read their horoscope daily than the Bible? Yes. Oh, yes. So... I worked for a newspaper uh, last year, and I mess- and I did this, Jonathan. I um I was in charge of making sure that all that stuff was in there, and I messed up and put the old one in from the day before. We had like 25 phone calls the next that morning, along talking about what's wrong with my horoscope. It's not telling me what I heard was yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Man, I would have had fun with them. I'd have probably had to say something like, "Did you not realize yesterday we said that your horoscope was going to repeat itself?" <laughs> you know, pull a Groundhog Day with them, something like that. Um, in all seriousness, though, guys, you know, we do, even though we don't call them mediums anymore, in the United States of America, there are people who put stock in that. Chapter 21 then moves into regulations and conducts for priests. 
The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, None shall defy himself for the dead among his people. Okay, so if you are in the priest family, you are a consecrated people, you're set apart. He says, If anybody dies except in your basic immediate family, don't touch them because that's going to make you unclean. It says, None shall defy himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, or his brother. Also his virgin sister who is near him, who has no husband, for her he may defile himself. Otherwise he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people, to profane himself. They shall not make any bald place on their heads, nor shall they shave the edges of the beards, nor cuttings of their flesh. Cuttings of their flesh. That is, by the way, a very big popular thing going on in the teenage movement right now. Tell me where we find something about cutting their flesh in the Bible. Say that louder. You're right. You're dead out spot on. Say it again. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can't understand yeah. what you're pointing at. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Priests on the Mount of Carmel, Elijah, they cut themselves. Okay, remember Elijah challenged them, and he says, you know, call out Baal, make your altar. And the priests got so caught up in trying to call out their God, they ended up doing what? Cutting themselves. You remember they were they were trying to really emotionally get into this thing, and yet it didn't work, did it? Okay. They go on to say they shall be holy to their God, not profane the name of their God, for they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire, and the bread of their God, therefore they shall be holy. Do not take a wife who is a harlot or a defiled woman. Verse 8, therefore you shall consecrate him, for he offers the bread of your God, he shall be holy to you. Notice verse 9, the daughters of any priest, if she profanes herself by playing the harlot, she profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. He who is in the high priest among his brethren, let's stop on verse 9 for just a minute. Verse 9, somebody tell me what is the initials PK, what does it stand for? Preacher's kid. Preacher's kid. How does the world view most preacher's kids? Bad. Bad. Very bad. bad. So they take that uh, Dusty Springfield song to heart. Isn't that, isn't that her name? The who? Isn't that Dusty? Dusty Springfield? The, um, the, the, the song about the preacher's son? Uh, it's an American song. <laughs> 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 are, you, uh, are you talking about uh, Footloose or whatever? Uh, uh, no, but that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Um, guys, in all seriousness, if your children are wild, that is preaching more of a sermon to the congregation than what you're saying from the pulpit, and I'm not kidding. If you don't have your household in order, and you get up to teach and preach the Word of God, and yet people can look at your own family and realize, he may be a great orator, but you know what? His kids are like little Indians running around. That's going to leave a big thing to them. And it, I think it's interesting that even starting in the Old Testament, God starts to lay out some instruction, not just for the priest, but for the priest's family. And we see this thread all throughout the Bible where he's basically, you know, we go back to Abraham and Isaac. And you remember, they didn't want a, a wife from Egypt. They wanted to keep these people pure, so to speak. Likewise, we need to make sure that our own kids grow up, whether they be infants or whether they be teenagers, they need to be examples in front of people. Now, I'm not saying that you need to have, uh, you know, expectations that are not realistic because all kids are going to mess up. All kids are going to sin. But I am telling you, it, it, there is something to be said for a preacher 
who can't keep his own family in line. Amen. Comments or thoughts before we move on? Um, just wait, wait a second. We got two girls, and that's throwing me. <laughs> Who's behind you? Oh, this is, uh, this I'm is Jordan's mother. mother. I'm Lori. Hey, Jordan's mother. Hello. It's good to have you in class. I'm sorry I called you out, but it's I've all I know Keely, and I didn't know you, so it's it's good to have you with us. When you hear a feminine voice over here, you don't know what to think. <laughs> well, I'm so used to just throwing the one, so that <laughs> Keely, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, what, what do you perceive as being appropriate, you know, if a preacher um, has rebellious children, you know, what what do you think, and not like just mistaken children or making common mistakes, but openly rebellious kids, what do you think should be the course of action with, with the preacher, what should he do? Uh, it's not really important what I think, it's important what the Bible says. Right. And uh, I think the Bible speaks very clearly in Proverbs of how to train up children. We don't necessarily preach it much in the church anymore, but, but guys, it still works today. Um, you're going to get to, like I've been telling you, you're going to have the opportunity to meet my kids. My oldest son, his name is Will. From about the time he was, say, eight or nine months until he was about two years of age, my wife and I, we practiced discipline with him. And by discipline, I mean discipline. I don't mean beating or abusing. But we disciplined our son any time that he did wrong. I honestly can't tell you the last time I've had to spank him because it, it worked so well when he was young that I can now look at my son or, or point to him, and I have no trouble from him. My 7-year-old, we're still working out a few kinks. Every once in a while, we have to kind of, have reminder sessions, shall we say. But it works. Um, my two two older boys, when I come to be with you guys, if, if we are in a worship setting together, you'll probably see them sitting by themselves up front on the first row because that's where they like to be. With Daddy speaking, they want to be on the front row. I wouldn't allow that if I didn't know for sure that they were going to be good examples and could handle it by themselves, and they can. You know, by age four, five, six, they need to be able to sit in a worship setting without disrupting, without causing issues. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't think that there's a problem expecting that from a kid. If if you have rebellious children, let me encourage you read read the wisdom of Proverbs and then apply. Uh, apply the Board of Education occasionally. <laughs> I'm just curious because when um, my family started going to uh, the congregation we're at now, the people at the congregation were shocked that my older brother and I, being teenagers, weren't openly rebellious. And, you know, the, the it just, I don't know, I came from a small town, so call me weird, but, you know, it just, I wonder, <laughs> with the, the, the preacher's kids especially, we're kind of you know, openly rebellious and made it difficult for their dad to, to teach on, th on certain things, you know. So I just wondered what would be the appropriate... See, I, 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 I want to see you guys in future classes change that whole persona from a PK being rebellious to a PK loving what their father does and either aspiring to do something similar or at least being able to teach and, and preach within the church. Because I, I think if we do our job correctly, my, my kids have got different talents already at, at very young ages. We know that. And I don't, you know, in all honesty, if they don't follow in my footsteps, it's not going to hurt my feelings at all. But I do want every single one of my children to be so faithful that if they're needed to teach a class or to preach a lesson, that they can do that and do it very effectively. Um I want them, and I've told them several times, I want them to use their talents that God has given them in a way in which not only will it help them, i.e., you know, earn a salary, but also help him. Now, that may be working on web design for, for nonprofit companies like Focus Press, or it, it may be physically preaching, or it may be working as a... Um, a preacher in a hospital, you know, you name it, whatever they want to do, we're going to support them 100%.
But I think the whole rebellion thing, I think part of that is we have given that to our culture. We've allowed them to think that, and I'm here to tell you it's time we take it back and show them that all preacher's kids are not rebellious, and some of them are actually training up in the right way to follow in their, their children's footsteps or their parents' footsteps. Chris. I know you can, you can have a seminar on this. I'm sorry, should somebody else go first? No, go ahead, then we'll, we'll come to the back after that. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you can have a you know, we'll call a seminar on this, but uh, when I first became a parent, I, I stopped and I thought, well, what's it going to take to make sure that my children are raised correctly? And, and, and that is uh, something I think about not only here, but uh, on a daily basis. But I, I tried to think about how did I respect my dad, and I respected my dad in two, in two different ways. I respected him in, in a fearful way. I knew that, uh, you know, he, he could whoop me if he wanted to. Uh, but the other way I, is I respected everything good that he did. But then uh, I can also see where my brothers and my sisters would become rebellious because a lot of times he would preach one thing and do the other. You know, do as I say, not as I, not as I do. And so I tried to apply those three principles to uh, myself as, uh, with raising my kids. Uh, they will need to fear me at times physically because uh, I'll yep. have control over them. But I want them to uh, fear me in, in a respectful way, just like Solomon yep. says to have that fear of the Lord, uh, you know, it, it, to respect me because he looks up to me and so forth. So that means I don't need to be doing things as well. He says that do as I say and not as I do. Uh, and I think that was a, a very key um, ingredient to the way I raise my kids. I still have one more to go for the most part, but... That's what I've tried to do. Hey, guys, if, if you've never done a study on how many times the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom, uh, fearing the Lord, if you haven't done that study, let me encourage you to just flip through a concordance at some point and look at that. And I am absolutely convinced if children grow up running their own household, not respecting or fearing their parents, they are going to have a hard time getting a proper relationship with God because if they don't fear their parents who they can see, how are they ever going to fear and respect God who they can't see? In the back. Thanks for your patience. I was just going to say that it's kind of comparable to what you were just talking about, about punishment in the church because it's getting to the point where parents are becoming afraid to physically punish their children because they might get taken away. In fact, I think in Canada already a child got called on his parents and basically told on them and got himself taken away because they physically punished him. Well, I think Jared could probably attest, New Zealand has got a, they call it uh, no smack, is that no, what do they call it? No uh, smacking law? Yeah, and then, they were simply put in a smacking ban, and we had a, a referendum recently, with, which is just basically a, a, a poll um, that the, the country sort of votes on. I think about 70 to 80 percent of people said that we should have the right to smack our children, and that it should not be considered. Um, uh, it should not be against the law. Essentially, smacking is spanking, by the way, guys. For New Zealanders, it's not smacking. I know y'all are all sitting there going, "Man, they smack their kids." Smack them. So. So the thing is, you know, even though the government had already put the law through, even though they'd seen the referendum saying that most people in the country, the clear majority, wanted to have the right to discipline their children in this manner and that it wasn't a criminal offence to do that, they still have not changed that, and that was over a year ago. And okay. Without getting into politics, I think there's, there's that things are being dictated to the country and to the politicians rather than... Uh, necessarily the, these guys coming up with it themselves. We sort of let well, America, America's yeah. following quickly in your footsteps, Jerry. Uh, California has already, on in some places, got a anti-spanking bill uh, that's been passed in some of the districts. It's like and the tail is wagging the dog. Exactly. And, and there, you know, we've talked already some about the fact that there are bills. There's this UN Protection of the Child Treaty that's coming down the pipeline. Lots of different things where they are clearly going against what the Bible says. Juanita, have you got a comment? I was just going to say that our ne nephew asked that, Uncle Jakey, where in the Bible does it say time out? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. 
I'm going to tell y'all, man, had my dad used time out, I would have sat there and thought about how in the way world can I do this next time without getting caught yeah. rather than thinking about what I'd done. But my dad did not use time out. Uh, my dad was 6'4", and he applied the Board of Education occasionally to the seat of discipline, shall we say, and it worked very well. <laughs> Back to Leviticus chapter 21, telling very specific rules of conduct for priests and their families. Uh, goes all the way into 22, um, chapter 22, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons that they may separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they do not profane my holy name by what they dedicated to me, I am the Lord. And he, he goes on to talk about descendants. Look at what he says in verse 4. Whatever man of a descendant of Aaron who is a leper or has a discharge shall not eat the holy offerings until he is unclean. Whoever touches anything made unclean by corpse or a man who has an omission of semen or whoever touches any creeping thing, he is unclean. Again, just over and over and over trying to remind them of the importance of Keeping clean for a holy God. Starting in chapter, or in verse 17. After laying forth and saying, okay, this is what I expect of the priest and his family. Now he says, here are the offerings that I accept. Here are the offerings that I don't accept. Look down in verse 24, actually 23 and 24. Either a bull or a lamb that has any limb too long or too short, you may offer as a free will offering, but for a vow, it should not be accepted. You should not offer to the Lord what is bruised or crushed or torn or cut, you shall, and, nor shall you make any offering of them in your land. What's, what's he trying to communicate in verse 24? What's the bottom line, if you had to sum it up? You want your best. Give God your best. And yet, what do many Christians today, real, realistically, what do we do? Give God our leftovers. Give him our leftovers. Guys, the, the idea of giving back to God is a, I mean, it, it permeates throughout the entire context of the Bible. God doesn't need it. It's already his anyway, as we're going to look at when we get to things like the, the year of Jubilee. Everything is his, period. But he is wanting people of their own free will to give back to him. And not just give him something, but give him their very best. Now, on a personal note, this is a, a Brad Harris soapbox for just a minute. Somebody please tell me why it is we give our best in the secular world. And yet when it comes to the church, we, we think, well, you know, that's just a church, so... We'll do it second rate, second class. Have you guys ever seen things done by the church that if it were in the business world would never be accepted that way? Mm -hmm. And yeah, well, you know, think about things like um, advertising. Or you think about maybe audiovisual equipment in some of these smaller churches or, you know, whatever it is. Businessmen recognize that would never fly where they work. But because it's the church, we're going to just kind of let it go. We'll just patch it through and, and hope it works well. Guys, I think that's a, a horrible misrepresentation of what we should be doing. Amen. I think God should be always be getting our best, period. Yeah, Chris. I like, uh, I've been noticing the World Video Bible School and their material coming out is, is really highly professional made, as well as your material as well. I mean, you, you obviously are putting out. Uh, I was going to say, your grade was slipping there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, uh, I've known yours for a while, but it wasn't until recently that I noticed the World Video Bible School. And, and so uh, I guess what I'm saying is it seems to be coming into the church now that that is important with all ministries. Yeah. yeah. Skip on down to verse 29. 
When you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, offer it of your own free will. When, you know, when we get up on Sunday morning and we talk about giving, we need to make sure that folks need to understand God has been asking for free will giving for a long time. He's not going to stand there and, and watch your wallet. He's not going to, you know, count whatever you put in there. He wants it to be of your own free will. On the same day, it shall be, okay, check this out. He's talking about a cow, verse 28. Whether it is a cow or you, do not kill both her and her young on the same day. When you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, offer it of your own free will. Verse 30. On the same day, it shall be eaten. You shall leave none of it until morning, for I am the Lord your God. What's, why is he saying that? What's the big deal there? Waste. Okay, waste is one. Sabbath day. Possibly, although he's not really instructing them what day, you know, it could be the Sabbath, but they could offer this thing on Monday. Is it to do with um, the, the cleanliness of the food? There you go. What did God know that they didn't back then? We spoiled. Did they have uh, G refrigerators in their tents? No. No. So there was a finite amount of time of how long that meat would be good to eat, was there not? Just like there is today. You leave meat out for so long, and for a while you can eat it. In fact, for a little while, the bacteria actually help tenderize the meat. After that point, once the bacteria start multiplying and exponentially, then it becomes bad. It becomes spoiled. It becomes nasty. nasty. And he's saying, don't be leaving food out on your counter all day Sunday and then eat it for Sunday night dinner. That's nasty. <laughs> I don't know if any of y'all do that. My wife's family does. I make them put it in the refrigerator. <laughs> that is just na I'm a I'm a microbe freak. I told you guys already. This is a good book. I want to read to you a part of it. It's called None of These Diseases by S.I. McMillan. If you don't have a copy of it, put one in your library. I know you guys probably watch your money pretty tightly. Find it cheaply on like Amazon or Half.com or something when it get, get you a used copy. Uh, S.I. McMillan. It's called None of These Diseases. What I want to do for just a few minutes, what time is it? Let's see. 2.41. Um, what I want to do for about 10 minutes, I want to read to you a couple of pages out of here in order for you to appreciate, number one, some of the stuff we've been reading in Leviticus and, and what we're getting to in Numbers, but also, number two, put it in context of when these discoveries started being made. Okay. The guy that we are going to be discussing mainly in this, what I'm reading right now, is a guy named Ignaz Semmelweis. I'll spell his name just so you can look him up online. It's I-G-N-A-Z, Ignaz. His last name is Semmelweis, S-E-M-M-E-L-W-E-I-S. -E -E One more time thing. Right. Sure. It's I-G-N-A-Z. His last name is S E M M. E L W E I S. There is a massive statue dedicated to this guy over in Vienna. Uh, I, I should probably tell you guys the uh, the ending first, and that is Ignaz Semmelweis. He was a doctor who ended up dying in a mental institution, literally kind of gone crazy out of his mind, which is not. Not the ending that you would think for somebody who they erected this massive statue to to give honor to, but listen very carefully at why they did that. It says, imagine you have a time travel machine. You can travel anywhere and any time. One day you set the time for May 1847. The destination is Vienna. When you arrive at the Vienna General Hospital, the morning mist is lifting from the immense courtyard. Walks crisscross azalea-filled flower beds. 
A young man wearing a black suit and a top hat, he heads for the entrance to the hospital. Mumbling as he walks, he is obviously upset. You follow him through the front door of the hospital building. You wince. The ward smells like a dead animal. Nurses bustle through the corridors. Muffled moans, coughs, and sobs are punctuated by a rare shriek of pain. You turn the corner. You enter the morgue. On the other side of the autopsy table, five medical students stand with their sleeves rolled up. On the table is the dead body of a young woman. Your preoccupied friend is the obstetrician, Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis. He hangs up his coat, his top hat, he rolls up his sleeves, and he asks how many women died last night. One student speaks. Three, she said. Josephine Frankel, Marie, and she continues going on. You notice a tear in his eye as the intern recites the names. Dr. Simmelboss shakes his head. <clears throat> Admission, delivery, death. Is that our motto, he said? One out of six women lying in our delivery beds ends up lying on this autopsy table. I can't accept this. The women die, and we have no idea why. The students are casting nervous glances at each other. They obviously have no idea why so many women are dying. They move to the business at hand. With bare hands, the students perform the autopsies, one after the other, without even breaking to wash their hands. The corpses have one thing in common. Pus. Pus-filled abdomens, pus-filled chest, even pus-filled eye sockets. The diagnosis for each person, each of the dead is the same. They call it labor fever. After the autopsies, the students merely rinse their bloody hands in water, wipe them dry on a rag, and they walk off to the maternity ward for the morning rounds. Their hands and the clothes still stink of rotting flesh. In the ward, many women are simply waiting to go into labor. Several are crying from labor pains. One is shivering from a raging fever. One is grasping her last few breaths. One has an ominous sheath pulled over her head. The students go from bed to bed asking questions, performing internal exams. Dr. Simmelweis double-checks their findings and makes several teaching points. Suddenly, you realize a rank reality. Their hands have been in pus, have been in blood and in dead bodies. They have been in pregnant women after pregnant woman. But nobody has yet washed his hands. What are they thinking? That moment is about to change. Suddenly, Simmelweis stops the rounds. He orders the interns to wash their hands. The interns laugh nervously, thinking, at first, it's a joke. But Dr. Simmelweis is not much of a joker. He's serious, intensely serious. Somebody finds a basin. Simmelweis watches each one wash in heavily chlorinated water. He sniffs their hands to make sure the smell is gone. Then he announces his theory. He suspects the cause of labor fever may be on their hands. Maybe that their hands are carrying labor fever from the dead to the living. The so-called modern medical care may actually be killing these women. Some of Eisen tells the students the evidence for his theory. says, number one, the women who have more internal exams are more likely to die of labor fever. Number two, he said a recent friend of his, another doctor, had suddenly died from blood poisoning from an inflamed finger cut. It turned out the cut he suffered was from performing an autopsy of a woman killed by labor fever. At his autopsy, they found pus in his abdomen, pus in his chest, pus on his brain. If there, he had been a new mother, his diagnosis would have also been labor fever. But he must have caught this from the woman's corpse. Number three, if a doctor delivers a baby, the death rate is 18%. If a midwife attends to the labor, the death rate is only 3%. Physicians do the autopsies. Midwives do not. Everything seemed to be pointing to the same conclusion, that the filth was on the doctor's hands, and that's what was killing the women. The history books tell us what happened next. Labor fever virtually disappeared from the ward. He asked them to clean their hands over and over. In just three months, the death rate fell from 18% to 1%. His findings were published in a medical journey, journal, but hardly anyone noticed. Semmelweis had made one of the most important discoveries in the history of medicine, isolating dead bodies from healthy people. But this idea didn't originate from Semmelweis. 3,000 years earlier, God had told Moses, whoever touches any dead body will be off limits for seven days. He quotes here in Numbers chapter 19, verse 11, those declared off limits had to take a shower of cleansing before they could reenter the community. What did off limits mean? 
If it meant that if you touched a dead body, you would have to leave your home, leave your job, spend an entire week alone in the surrounding desert, according to Numbers chapter 5. The ancient Hebrews avoided becoming off-limits at all costs. They did not touch the dead body or the disease-causing bacteria that died with the corpse. This was in contrast to the customs of Egypt, where Moses had spent the first 40 years of his life. Egyptians made mummified mummies of the dead bodies. In fact, he goes into talking about what was the way that they mummified people, what were they expected to do, and yet the body basically gives the, the answer. So he says, let's go back to Semmelweis for just a moment. One day, the doctors and students examined a row of 12 women. Eleven of the twelve caught labor fever and died. Semmelweis's alert brain gave birth to a new idea. Maybe the doctor's hands could transfer labor fever from one living woman to a, another living woman. He ordered a new routine, that doctors must wash their hands after every internal examination, no exceptions. If he seemed silly before, now he became the crazy Dr. Clean Freak. Students howled in protest, washing, washing, always washing, what a nuisance, my hands are chapped. They stink of chlorine. Despite the protest, the death rate dropped even further. Even the father of cellular pathology, Dr. Virchow, ridiculed Dr. Semmelweis. The faculty clung to their own false theories of labor fever being caused by things like constipation, late lactation, panic attacks, and bad air. Eventually, he was fired from his job and went down in history at that time as basically a freak. Why did I read that to you? He reinvented the wheel. He reinvented the wheel because the Bible had already told him what? Don't touch dead people. Don't touch dead people. Not only don't touch dead people, guys, realize in all of these things that we're going through in Levit the book of Leviticus, he is reminding them how to be clean, how to get into that inner box. Dr. Semmelweis, you're talking about 1840s. Remember, it was 1860s when Louis Pasteur finally came along with the germ theory of disease. Semmelweis beat him to it. Louis Pasteur is the one that got credit for it. Jared. Uh, I think it's important to note that while we may think we know everything now, science may have that arrogance about it uh, with the way it talks, that we're very much in the same situation now. Uh, I mean, with, with my experience, and I know you know it as well, Brad, that there's just so much stuff that the more we find out, the less we realize we know. So, uh, Absolutely. I mean, the, to me, the more complex, the more details we find out in the, in the, for instance, the field of anatomy, the more complex it really is and the more questions there are. Um, I want you guys to, to fully grasp the idea that the Egyptians, even though they were supposed to be the wealthy, they had some horrible medical procedure. I was reading one last night in this book where one of their prescriptions was to take the blood of a worm and donkey dung in order to help cure a cut. Now, that's pretty nasty, and it didn't really work. The point, the point being, God is giving them better instruction with the idea of knowing that there are bacteria out there that could cause us to get sick, even though these people didn't have the technology to know what a bacteria was, to see one. That's why it's a big deal. Yeah? I, just know that I also heard that their cure for headaches and migraines was to take a hammer and a chisel to the head and get the evil spirit out of there. <laughs> you talking about the Egyptians? Mm -hmm. The Egyptians? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, those of you who know anything about mummification, you know the Egyptians put very, very little thought into the brain. Uh, they thought the, the physical heart was the core of man. And as such, when somebody died, they, they went to great painstaking efforts to leave the heart in place. But they would usually pull the brain out of the body through the nose. They would basically... You can think of it as taking a coat hanger up the nose, and they would physically pull the brains out of the nose, throw it out. Because and the reason I know this, we know this, is because we find 
brain tissue in clumps all over the desert of Egypt. From where they had pulled it out, it had dried in the sun, and in some cases actually would either petrify or, or fossilize where we could find it later on. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any, anything else oh, yeah, before we yeah, move on? Um, it, it always is mentioning about how the Hebrew people multiply a lot faster than um, uh, the Egyptian people. Uh, could it be that um, maybe we're just seeing with Moses uh, the application of an oral law that's already been in place with uh, the Hebrew people or with with Joseph and his offspring, um, they've been obeying some form of uh, godly practice with regard to cleanliness, and that's why the women are so productive, is that they actually survive childbirth and they can have more? Absolutely. That's, I think that's probably part of it. Um, we know for sure that the Israelites were using midwives. We have that in the text. You know, you guys remember... One of the Pharaoh's commands to the midwives was to do what? Kill all the boys. Kill all the little boys. And yet the midwives came back and said, man, we can't do it. They're too quick. They have babies too quick. So we know for sure the Israelites were using midwives, which, according to this, was had a much, much higher uh more uh, not mortality rate, a higher rate of, of living than if they were to go into a formal medical institution. So that's probably part of it. I would also say there may have been something genetically, and there may have been also the hand of God acting providentially somehow. Mr. Cooper. Uh, question. Weren't some of the Egyptians uh, homosexuals, a lot of them? <laughs> Man, some of the Egyptians, some of the Israelites, some of the Americans, some of the Russians, some of the Chinese. <laughs> yes, they were. Um, absolutely they were. And, you know, unfortunately when you – I don't know how much history everybody in that room has had. I know you come from varied backgrounds. I know some of you may have uh, more degrees past your name than – than you ever will need, and I know some of you may not have any, but let me encourage you strongly, on your own, do some reading on world history, specifically looking at the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans, because I think if you will avail yourself of what was going on with those three groups of people, it will give you a much broader appreciation for not only the Old Testament, but also what happens to cultures that give over to abominations to God. And ironically, ironically, one of the things that you're going to see in all of those is you get these massive cultures that grow and they are the world power and they fall from within just like America is doing today. We're Like it or not, we are falling from within. I was just pointing that out because... Um that, that, would, that would actually be another factor. Um, as yeah, because homosexuals can't reproduce. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I love that, you know, supposedly homosexuality is on the rise in America, and they want to say that there's a gay gene. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's really kind of a problem since homos can't reproduce, and it's supposed to be genetic. I mean, if you think about it, guys, it... It would die out if it's genetic because they can't reproduce. Now, I would say the mainstream media propaganda has increased, but not necessarily homosexual activity. All right, any comments, questions before we move on to chapter 23? All right, chapter 23 talks starts getting into feast dedication to the Lord. Uh, starting in verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which shall proclaim to be a holy convocation, these are my feasts. So, I want you to sacrifice 
I want you to be a clean people, and oh yeah, by the way, I also want you to respect the following special days, holidays maybe we would call them. Number one, the Sabbath. Every single week, I want a day. Verse three, six days shall work be done, but the seventh, the Sabbath of rest, a, co a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. I don't know how many of you all have met actual uh, Orthodox Jews, but if they are truly an Orthodox Jew, they physically do not even turn on a light switch on the Sabbath. I mean, they consider that doing work. So I actually had to work with one when I was in, uh, we were doing some, Alzheimer's studies in a lab, and we had a, a guy who was a Jewish neurosurgeon. And every, I guess it was every Friday, he would go home and he would cook all the food he was going to eat the next day, and he would leave his apartment, the lights on the way that he wanted them the next day, so that all he physically would do is get up, move from one room to the next, and eat when it was time. And that was it. I mean, he would not leave his place. He wouldn't do anything. Which, you know, I, I recognize to us as weird and foreign and all. But in a way, guys, you got to give it up that if he was using that time to pray and meditate on the Lord, that's, that's not a bad thing. Amen. I would say that, you know, in the United States, the blue laws, as we used to call them, they were probably a pretty good thing because you couldn't go out and shop and buy and do everything on Sunday. And that was a day for people to rest, be with family, and think about God. Now it's basically just another day, but the mail doesn't run. The next one, starting in verse 4. The Passover unleavened bread. These are the feasts of the, whole, of the Lord, holy convocations which shall proclaim at their appointed times, on the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Somebody tell me from what we've covered thus far, when did God institute a calendar, a new calendar system for these people? At the Exodus. Remember he said, at the Exodus, he said, okay, this is basically going to be the starting of the new year for you right here. From now on, you're going to measure time according to when I released you, according to when you, when you came free. And now he's saying, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a holiday to remind you of that particular deal every single year. It will be on the 14th day of the first month to remind you that I let you free from bondage. Verse 7, on the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. <clears throat> but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. Seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. Then we get to the Feast of the First Fruits. Some of your Bibles may talk about the harvest. Here again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and you reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it off. You shall offer on that day, when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year, blemish, uh, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. So again, in everything that they did, their entire life, whether it was harvesting grain, whether it was growing animals, whether it was making bread, whether it was the, the first fruits from their garden, everything needed to give acknowledgement to the fact that God was their sustainer and that everything came through him. You know, as to me, that's probably one of the areas where we have fallen so far away in the church is that we don't really, realistically, we give God three hours a week. Mm. Sunday morning at 9, Sunday morning at 10, Wednesday night at 7. Sometimes Sunday night at 6. And that's it. 
And I think because of that, many, many, many Americans, they have programmed their mind to have a church side and a, a regular side or a secular side. And as soon as Wednesday night at, you know, at 8 o'clock comes, they're back into that work zone. Well, I got to get up in the morning, got to go to work, got to go to school, got to do this. And those, those two sides never meet. And so God never really plays over into our normal workaday life. These people, that would have been so foreign to them. They could not fathom a, a normal work week without acknowledging God in just about everything they do. I think we're almost the opposite of that. We only acknowledge God a very small, small percentage of the time. Thoughts, comments? All right. <clears throat> Feast of the Weeks, starting in verse 15, the Feast of Trumpets in verse 23, the Day of Atonement, starting in verse 26. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, remember, guys, we already read about the Day of Atonement. On the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls. Offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Notice verse... I'm going to read 28 and 29, but I want you to notice the phrase, uh, afflicting in soul. Verse 28 says, you shall do no work on the same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you on behalf of the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. What's the text talking about right there? Smell like repentance. Yeah. Guys, if, if, if these people didn't feel it, if they weren't going through some mental anguish and suffering, he's saying cut them off. If they don't look at their own status and realize, man, I've, I, have, I have messed up, I'm not worthy, then they need to be cut off from their people. How do you think that message would go over with the Hollywood elite today? What do you think? Not very well. Can anybody in that room, in all seriousness, can you can you see? And you, you pick your own star, but you know, take the top five grossing movies. Movie star, actress, whatever. Take the top five actors or actresses and ask them one day a year to do nothing but contemplate what they've done wrong in the sight of God. I don't know that they, first off, I don't think that they would even realize they've done anything wrong. Second, they certainly aren't going to take a day out of their busy life to give it to God, unless they get paid for it and can sign an autograph for it or something. Third, I don't know that Hollywood even knows the definition of humbling. Because many of them have kind of elevated themselves in the, up to the status of a God. And yet, every single year, these people were to humble themselves and make sure that they were afflicted in soul. Verse 33 starts talking about the Feast of Tabernacle. In fact, look on down at verse, thir uh, verse 39 of that chapter. <clears throat> also, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered the, in the first or in the fruit of the land, you should keep the Feast of the Lord for seven days. For the first day there should be Sabbath of rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath of rest. You shall take for yourselves on the first day. The fruit of beautiful trees, the branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy leaves, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So he is specifying which holidays these people are to observe, which festivals, which special days he wants. Go back to, let's see. What do you think he's talking about at the end of the chapter where he says, verse 42, You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations 
may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God, so Moses declared to the children of Israel for the feast of the Lord. What's he talking about right there? What they had to live in when they first left Egypt. Yeah. He's saying, you may have built nice houses, but I want you to go camping, basically. Because I want you to remember what it was like when you first came out. Not only do I want you to remember it, I want you to pass that on to your offspring so that they understand fully. Kind of getting back to that multi-generational faithfulness. Chapter 24. He starts telling them exactly how he wants them to take care of this new worship setting. Care of the tabernacle lamps. The bread of the tabernacle. Penalty for blasphemy. Look, starting, I'm going to back up, start in verse 8 for just a second. Every Sabbath, he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel for by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place. For it's the most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by perpetual statute. Notice verse 10. Actually, what time? Hey, Wayne? Yes. How? What time are they going to break? Uh, 2.15, five minutes. Okay, I think we can get through this next point. Okay. The son of, of Israelite, notice verse 10. Now, the son of an Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel. This Israelite's woman's son and a man of Israel fought each other in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. So they brought him to Moses. Verse 12, then they put him in custody that the mind of the Lord might be shown to them. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, take outside the camp him who has cursed. Let all who heard him lay their hands on his head and let all the congregation stone him. All right. First and foremost, what was the deal here? What's going on? I don't know, but they, put, they, put, they laid their hands on all the animals they sacrificed. Okay, they laid their hands on the, remember, like the scapegoat, etc. Yeah. Why do you think they wanted to lay, everybody that heard him lay their hands on this guy? Get it out yeah. Of Bearing witness on him, maybe? Bearing witness that he did do this, maybe? Okay. So they're bearing witness. Lodge, do you say, because they heard it? Yeah, because it was inside of them. They were kind of doing like a scapegoat and letting it get out of them. Yeah, I mean, think about this, guys. If you hear curse words today, that gets implanted right up here. Amen. So even though you didn't speak them, you still heard them, and your mind is still processing that word. Yes. So God is not only is he fixing the guy who said it, He's making sure that those who heard it are also in some way cleansed and taken care of. So he, he says, I want you to kill the guy, but oh yeah, before you kill him, I want everybody that heard those words to come up, lay your hands on them, to get rid of that, to realize that that's not something that, that we need to have today. Let's go back and, and look at verse 10 very carefully. The son of an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian... Now, what would you call this person? Half-breed? Half-breed or mixed breed or whatever you want to call it. However you want to define it in your own words. Why in the world do you think they gave this particular example in the Bible? Intermarriage. Um, maybe. Look at verse 16. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All of the congregation shall certainly stone him. The stranger as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Now, think with me for just a moment. 
It says a stranger or a native in the land. This guy technically was kind of both, was he not? His dad was an Egyptian. His, his mom was Israelite. This is kind of the perfect example that nobody is outside of this law of blasphemy. But God's saying, not only am I holding the Israelites accountable for blasphemy, if an Egyptian comes up here and he starts saying bad things, I want you to take him out too. How would this go over with our society today? It says, verse 16, Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. Do we have anybody that blasphemes the Lord today? Oh, yeah. Guys, do you realize we're putting it on T-shirts now? Oh, wow. Hmm. I mean, bumper stickers. I've seen some bumper stickers that I kid you not. I'm trying to figure out how to get around, like, dodge the car so my children won't read them because they're that filthy. What about curse words on TV? Do we hear any of that? <laughs> All right. While we're on it, I'm going to bring this up. I realize we may have to come back to it after the break. What is a euphemism? A term that means something else? I knew I was going to get caught by the spell. Y'all go get caffeined up and talk about what a euphemism is and be ready to talk about it when we come back.